Commissioner, Mr Welsh is back, I'll hand over. Yes, Ms. Um, Ms. Commissioner, Ms. Welsh, Mr Welsh has already been sworn. Yes. Um, Mr Welsh, have you received a summons to attend the Commission hearing today? Yes. Do you have the original summons with you? Yes. Thank you, that, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes. The summons to Mr Welsh will be Exhibit 3.21. Mr. Walsh, do you have a, a statement with you in relation to rubric 311? Yes. Is that the statement in front of you there? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any corrections to make to the statement? No. Mr. Walsh, is your statement true and correct? Yes. Tender that also, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.22, the witness statement of Mr. Welsh concerning rubric 3-11. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, yes, Mr. Hyde. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Welsh, I just wanted to begin by asking you some questions about, some general questions about Westpac's business banking and to work through a few aspects of that to understand changes in the small business market over the last few years. So can we start by bringing up your statement? And If we go to page 10 of the statement, I'm sorry, my version doesn't have a doc ID on the top, but presumably it's dot 0010, thank you. There's a table, Mr Welsh, that you've set out as part of your statement dealing with the number and quantum of business loans submitted to and approved by Westpac's business bank division in the period from 2012 through until 2017. You see that there? Yes. And I want to first just break down what is meant by the business bank division. You've explained in your statement that the business bank division provides banking services to what you've termed micro SME, SME and commercial banking customers. Yes. And micro SME customers are customers who are sole traders or businesses with less than four employees and have lending requirements of up to $250,000? Yes. And SME customers are businesses with a turnover of less than $5 million and lending requirements of up to $3 million? Yes. And you were, as I understand it, at, for a period of time, the general manager in relation to business banking? Is that right? Not. You're not now, but you were back in 2006 to 2008? Yes. And just so I can understand, does the, the business bank is lending to micro SMEs? That's right? Yes. It's lending to SMEs? Yes. And are there also commercial business customers that the business bank lends to? Yes, they do. And when we look at the figures that are set out here, these are the figures not only for micro SME and SME loans, but also for commercial business customers? That is correct. Okay. And what we can see is that between 2012 and 2017, there's been some growth, about 10% growth in the number of facilities submitted for approval by the business bank division? Yes. And some growth more than 10% in the number of facilities actually approved? Yes. And growth, relatively significant growth, more than 10% in the total limit approved? Yes. And growth perhaps of about 30 or 40 per cent of the average size of facility approved? Yes. And then you've also got a table in paragraph 29 that goes through changes in the number and quantum facilities submitted and approved for franchise businesses? Yes. And that, I assume, just means the franchisee business. It's not a franchise or business. Yes. And we see, again, some growth 
in the number of facilities submitted, some growth in the number of facilities approved, relatively significant growth in the total limit approved and relatively significant growth in the average size of this facility approved? Yes. And what I want to understand just at the beginning is your view as to changes in the market for lending to small businesses and I think you've used the term micro SME and SME customers, given that they would have up to $3 million of facilities. I, think I'll, I might just refer to those as small business customers, if that's acceptable to you. Yes. And this information, I'm not sure that we can necessarily draw conclusions about what's happened just in relation to small business lending for Westpac, because it includes commercial lending for higher facilities. And I'm just interested in your view about that. Uh, so uh, broadly in the market, we've seen since 2012 uh, improving growth in, in SME, in the SME segment that you refer, refer to. So that's more small businesses backing themselves to, to invest. So we, we have seen that and that's been a, a pretty consistent trend where, uh, in the growth. So for Westpac, you've seen growth in the number of loans being applied for, for that SME market? Yes. And obviously growth in the number of loans being approved? Yes. And in terms of your position in the market, do you have a view as to how Westpac's position in the market has changed over the course of the last five years in relation to SME lending? Uh our market share growth has been nom nominal. It oscillates a bit, but nothing out, nothing extraordinary there. Just in line with market would be the best way of putting it. Have you seen increased competition from lenders for effectively giving dollars to small businesses? Yes, that's correct. The, a, a number of lenders have focused on the the SME market to to help small businesses, and and we have seen more competition there as. Our competitors uh, support Australian businesses. And is that, when you're talking about the competitors there, I, if we can just segment them up, does that include increased competition from the other three majors? Uh, the three majors and also some of the, the other uh, banks? Yeah, so, and I just want to break it up because it seems Please. like there's, there's a few different categories mm -hmm of competitors that you would face in relation to lending to the SME market. One are the other three major banks. One is the, the non-major banks. One is non-bank lenders. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanna work through each of those mm -hmm. categories. Have you noticed any change in the appetite for small business lending of the other three majors over the last five years? I think they've all got a clear strategy to try and support this market and improve in it and, and back businesses. So uh, you can read the annual reports and they show that. And my read of some of their investor presentations show they're focused on on the, the SME market. So yes, the, the, if the question is around competition, yes, yes. the competition has increased there. And in relation to the non-major banks, have you noticed any change in the appetite of the non-majors for lending to small and medium enterprises? It tends to be uh, more focused on their particular state or area. Some of the, the, the non-majors, as you call them, are, are based in, a, in Queensland, for instance, and, and they're pretty hot competition there because that's where most of their branches and, and their bankers are. So you tend to find in, in areas they're, they're particularly strong or they may focus on a, a particular segment, but I, you know, other than that, I wouldn't call out anything exceptional. And what about non-bank lenders to SMEs? Have you noticed any change from competition from non-bank lenders over the last five years? Probably more laterally rather than as broad as the last five years. There's emerging fintech where there's financial technology where they're looking more at uh, supporting small business. So there's, there's, there's more, a lot more of them popping up, yes. Right. And, and that's what in the, more like in the last couple of years rather than in the more last so, five years? More so than five years. Right. And are there different observable approaches to different 
segment, so I'll explain that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. If we take just property development, mm -hmm. for example, has there been, is there a difference in what you can see in competition for lending to property developers as distinct from the broader SME market? There's always uh, distinctions in each bank based on their risk appetite, uh, based on what their start position is, based on their view of the market. So, yes, you do. You, you can see differences in the market, yes. And in relation to property development then, and I, I just want to get an understanding of this because as you, you put this into some context, now, 10 years ago, as we sort of came into and out of the GFC, there were obviously a number of issues that arose for property developers mm -hmm. and a change in the risk appetites of banks in relation to property developers. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to get some sense of for, to assist the Commissioner is where are things at now in relation to that sort of market? And it may be, and I should say, that when it comes to property development, calling it SME, if we limit SME to facilities up to $3 million is inaccurate anyway. Typically, uh, with the price of Australian property today, it's a little outside the, the yes. uh, three million for the property developers. So, property developers more in the commercial business, and uh, that's a pretty closely um, watched market, both uh, by a number of regulators and also by banks, because it's it's something that we're very sensible about how we approach that market. And the, the, it, it does evolve. You you watch it very carefully, though, and uh, you're very thoughtful about. Uh, the the market, uh, the uh, the amount of developments happening. You also look at things like concentration risk for builders. So and and banks have different appetite at different point in times because it depends where their where their book is positioned and and how they view the market. But you do a fair bit of research for the broader market on that. Right. And when you say it's closely watched, is that synonymous with being? cautious and very careful, or does it mean something slightly different? I think we're cautious and uh, careful for all of our loans on, on that, but, sure. but, but to be uh, clearer on the, the property, you, you break it down into a number of ANZAC codes and, and uh, we look at that quite closely. There's a number of committees that, that you might focus, that focus on property. Well, there's one particular committee for us that focuses on property that, that looks at it and and, and we look at our, our book because the way we think about uh, property and the way you th typically think about a portfolio is you look at uh, the institutional exposure. Westpac has a, a very strong institutional bank, so we'd look at that. We've also got our St George group that is particularly strong at, at property, so you look at that and, and you look at your overall shape of the book and how that's performing and, and to the future. And, and just again to help the Commissioner mm with that, when you talk about the shape of the overall book, you mean one of the th things you're calling out is you want to look at how much of your book is allocated to property development, how much is allocated to hospitality, how much is allocated to retail, that type of thing, is that? Is you that tend to look at property development, uh, <laughs> investment, residential development, well, they're, they're, they're some of the headings that you, you look at. and and to make sure that you're not, your book is not overweight in lending to those in, into one particular area. Is that? Uh, one of the reasons, yes. Yeah. And, and what are the other reasons that would be relevant? Oh, you want to look at how your book might be um, performing in, in terms of geographies. So in the, in the, you might want to look at Melbourne market, Sydney market, they're, they're, all the markets are slightly different and, and have different, um, trends at different times, so you, you, look at a, you might look at a market, you might even break it down and look at inner city, uh, inner city Melbourne and to, to outer, for instance. So you, you know, it depends on the degree of analysis you, you want to do. And, and, and you know, a property book is a, is a bigger book for, for the, Westpac, uh, the Westpac group. So by definition, when you have bigger books, you typically would put more analysis around a, a bigger exposure. And again, just to bear down on a little bit of that, 
are you talking about even just the level of scrutiny within that property book of where is it located? Are we How much of our lending to property is in Melbourne? How much of our lending to property is in Perth? How much of it is in Brisbane? Is that the type of thing you're calling out there? Uh, on the uh, pr property's somewhat unique in that it's quite a large, it's a large book. So the way Westpac structures in the commercial uh, business is that we have specialised property bankers, and there are a number of them, and there's, there's teams, they're, in a, they're uh, under one leadership team, so uh, often the complexity in banking is to get the data is, is often quite uh, more challenging than what, what we would want. So you, by doing that, you can therefore have a bit stronger view on the, on the market, and then you have to provide an overlay where a, a leader is uh, accountable for that team, and they would typically look at a, at a business plan of, of what they wanted to do in the year, which looks forward, but also looks back and looks what, how much of their book is running off, how much of their book is on investment and how much book is on commercial property. And tell me if these questions are going beyond what is within the specifics of your experience, please. But if the, the last thing that I'm interested in is in managing the shape Presumably, one of the things that you're keeping an eye out for is, are, are we overexposed to lending in one particular area? And that might be a particular industry, it might be to a particular physical or geographical area. There's different ways that you might be overexposed. But if that's identified as a problem or a potential problem, how is that managed? Um, hypothetically, you're you're looking at uh, the the market and and look trying to look forward and predict what's going to happen. So that's probably the the first thing. Then you're looking at your your current book and and trying to understand the dynamics of of how that would typically typically work over the next period. And, and then the the main control point to to come back for the clarity of your question is that you would then typically look at an appetite. For there, where you might might say, for instance, in a particular state, you you um, were were wanting to limit the amount of of, of growth there, uh, and there's there's a number of ways of doing that. And for example, you might impose a cap on the amount of new lending in a particular area. Is that one way? Um, that that's a blunt way. We'd like to think we're a little bit more sophisticated than that. You know, you're. No, no, that's fine. Please expand. Well, on your, your your preference, you you always back your longest standing customers, so you you back the ones that have been with you for a long time. They're your they're your first, um, your primary one. Um, then there's a, a range of uh, that, that follows from from that. You you tend to want to be backing exper if you're a bit worried about a sector. You tend to want want, want to back a bit more of the uh, experienced players you, uh, that that are there, and you may well tilt to your business a bit if you've got a bit more in a city apartment, for instance, you may look to some outer outer region apartments. And that I I think involves the idea that that you could be out there sort of looking for these opportunities. And I'm just I'm just trying to understand whether that's what you mean or whether it's something different. You that just is the help bank. Me. Sorry, the bank could be out there rather than the customer I'm coming to the bank <laughs> and saying to the customer, "I've got a, I've got this particular property development." That instead the bank would be out there looking for customers who might be trying to do that sort of thing. But I wonder if I've misunderstood the point. No, it's, you're a, it's a combination of, of both. It will be uh, obviously the bank looking for new business. It will be clients that you have already. It will be referrals from from other clients or, or partners such as um, solicitors or accountants that that know know your your market and also uh, introducers in the, the in the broker market. And that, I think, sounds like what you might try to do is to just to steer away from using the blunt <laughs> instrument of putting in a cap. You try to incentivise bringing in lending in the areas you're trying to build up. Is that a fair summary of it? Um, you, you, you try and put your energies focused on the, the markets that you're targeting and the types of deals that, that you're... You're, you're targeting. 
So you can, you, the, once you've got the deal on, you have to back, you want to back your client through the cycle. So you tend to focus more on the, what we would call the front book, the, the new business. And then, then you're sort of looking at the shape of the, the new business and making calls on that. And sometimes they're tough calls because your banker might be saying, this is a great market, and you'll look at some other data and data points where you'd say, well, I think we might want to slow that, slow our origination in that market for, for new business. All right. So it's, it's as much, there's a bit of an art and a science on it. It's, it's not as blunt, it's not as clear as just looking at some numbers and standing back and making a call. You, you, try, you want to use judgment. Yes, and judgment over a period of time. That is, you've, you've, it's not something you can judge at any particular point in time. You have to be constantly thinking about this and strategising over the medium to long term. You'd like to think so, yes. I want to then turn to some issues about franchises and mm -hmm. we're going to move mm -hmm. into the particular case study that you're mm -hmm. dealing with. Mm -hmm. You gave some evidence either on Monday or Tuesday, the days are starting to blur together, <laughs> I suspect for both of us, Mr Welsh, um, but you gave some evidence about the accredited franchise program mm -hmm. and how that, how that works. I don't want to return to that other than to note that if there's an accredited franchise or from Westpac, then you obtain past financial performance information about the accredited franchise or? Yes, that's correct. And you want to have that information in order to decide whether or not they should be an accredited franchise or to begin with? The financial information is one part of it, yes. Yes. And so what are the other types of parts to it that you'd be concerned about? Uh, not so much concerned. Uh, if, I, if maybe if I just go a little higher more broadly, is why a franchise system might come about as they, you know, the normal life cycle of a franchise system is they, they start out with someone starting out a, a typically a good a business that's in one particular area and then they're looking to, to expand and to grow that. So we would um, look at their plans and part of that is you'd look at who their management are and what their capability are, what their experience is. You would um, look at what their strategy is. You'd look at what their point of difference is. Uh, if they've got any unique proposition, you'd look at how they're going to bring on franchisees and the training that they would give them, for, for instance. You'd look at their, their, their aspirations, their growth aspiration, and, and you'd look at how they would be, would, would be funding themselves in the future because any business that's going through growth Needs to needs to fund themselves, and uh, they're usually growing at, starting to grow at a at a quicker rate. So you have to look through the the numbers quite carefully. And I think the evidence that you gave earlier was, as a result of that accreditation process, Westpac gains a better insight into the financial state of the franchise. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes, you do. And that insight into the financial state of the accredited franchise systems is kept up to date by annual reviews that Westpac undertakes? It is now. And could we just clarify that qualification? When you say it is now, why do you say that? Uh, I say that because in 2010-12, sort of uh, we tended to not it was once every three years that you had to review for a, a long, longer form, and we might do shorter form reviews. We've, ten, we've brought that into to more regular annual reviews now. All right. And we're going to come, as you know, to HiFace, which had been accredited as a franchise with Westpac back in perhaps 2011. I think there's some ambiguity about it, but something like that? Yes. And at, as at 2011, 2012, did, the poli did Westpac's policy require annual reviews? No, it didn't. I see, it only required reviews every three years, as you understood it. Long form reviews, yes. All right, and sorry, there's, is there a distinction then between a short form review and a long form? Yes, there is. 
Okay. And could you just explain that distinction? Um, the, the, the long form review would typically be the, the review that you would do uh, the, for an origination of a, a new franchise system. So you'd want to have much more, uh, you, you want to have your full approach at looking at it. The short form review tends to be a particular, focusing on a particular issue if, if some circumstances had, had changed. So if they change their strategy to, to grow quicker or to or enter into a different market, so it might be a um, a review on that basis. I see. And by doing the or by initially obtaining the financial information from the franchise, Westpac then seeks to develop the sector to value ratio. Yes, that's correct. And. You've told, as I understood the evidence that you've given, and I think this was dealt with a few times, your evidence is the sector to value ratio is a percentage which is used to calculate the maximum amount that Westpac will lend to the franchise in an accredited franchise system against only cash flow. Is that... Have I if it... Thank you. If it's the cash, if you're leaning against the cash as a going concern with no other security other than than guarantees from the directors, which is a a normal course. Uh, sorry, from the shareholders. We might just turn up the policy because I'm. I just want to make sure I've. I haven't misunderstood the point that you're making. When you say without guarantees, let's take a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you've got, let's say that the SVR for a particular franchise is 60%. Yes. And if the SVR for a particular franchise is 60%, does that mean that Westpac, under its policy, could lend up to 60% of the turnkey price of the business just against the cash flow of the business? Uh, the, the debt sizing, as we term it, that you'd lend 60% to that. You'd then want to make sure that the interest cost cover and debt service cover ratios worked as well, because you want to then... So one's the amount of debt, the other is the, the, the cash flow. All right, let's... Can we bring up WBC.410.? Double zero one dot two zero nine two. And which just, tab is that, please? Uh, that is should be tab twenty five. Twenty five. Thank you. If we just pop out the paragraph that begins lending under this policy, it's the second paragraph under target market. Mm -hmm. And I think, Thank you. That's easy. <laughs> I think the way in which I defined it was the ratio of the loan amount to the turnkey purchase price of yep. the business, but let's mm -hmm. assume turnkey purchase price of the business is synonymous with mm -hmm. turnkey value of the business. Mm -hmm. Is my understanding correct, or are you saying something slightly well, different? Your understanding is correct. Yeah, so if, for example, the business was going to cost the turnkey value of the business was $300,000 and the SVR ratio was 60%, then Westpac would be prepared to lend up to $180,000 just against cash flow. Correct. Well, that would be... Subject to the cash flow. Sorry? Subject to the cash... Checking the cash flow. Subject this is further in the policy. That's right. Yes. And... And then I think you referred to... The next point, which is any borrowing in excess of the SVR is to be supported by other tangible security in terms of acceptable security rules. Yes. And that would mean, would it, that if you wanted to lend, or if the borrower wanted to borrow 100% of the purchase price for the business, mm -hmm. they could borrow 60% unsecured other than assuming the 
relevant criteria were satisfied against the turnkey value of the business, against the cash flow. I, sorry, I put that badly. I'll say no, it no. again. Please. They could borrow 60% of the turnkey value of the business secured only against the cash flow, but the balance of 40% they would need to secure against, for example, residential property, something else. No, that's not correct. Okay, and could, so could you just explain what is the thing that I've misunderstood there about that paragraph? So there's, uh, so you, you either fall into the sector, uh, the franchising policy, and if you don't, then it's the business credit manual that would apply. So you don't get a, you don't, as I, I thought I heard you say you take, you can borrow 60% under the franchising policy and then another 40% under the, under the, if you wanted to borrow the whole lot, under the uh, normal, the business credit manual. So if you if you don't qualify for if you don't if you are above the sixty percent, then the franchising policy is off the table. I see. And um, if you if you are borrowing an amount above the sector value ratio, yes. then the accredited franchise policy can't apply to you. Thank you. Far better put. Is that right? Yes, it is right. And because read literally, that paragraph we're looking at appears to say that you can lend against the cash flow for the sector value ratio and any borrowing in excess of the sector value ratio is to be supported by other tangible security. No, so that's not how it should be read. But that's not how it, well, at no, least that's, that's not, not the practice. It's, and that's, that's not how it's applied. Yep. All right. Indeed. And what is the reason for that? Because um, the the policy is a going concern policy, and as a going concern policy, you want slightly higher interest cost cover, and there's more risk uh, around that. So if you take on more debt, then there's without uh, potentially looking at other cash flows and and other security, then the the risk profile changes. So it's a risk based decision. I see. The point is, you've taken on debt greater than whatever is the sector value ratio and simply having a real tangible security for that extra amount of debt above the sector value ratio doesn't mean that you've eliminated the extra risk involved in that extra debt. That's the point? Yes. And hence the reason why what the willingness that Westpac has to lend in relation to accredited franchises, sorry, franchisees of accredited franchise systems against cash flow really is just limited to the sector value ratio because it's satisfied itself that cash flow up to the, based on the, is sufficient to service debt up to the sector value ratio. Well, you, you apply your uh, financial covenants then. Right. And so that's the reason why when we get to this particular case study the, and the borrowing that we've already heard about, it was done not under the accredited franchise policy but under the general yes. business because yes. it was for greater than whatever the relevant SVR was for a pie face franchise. Yes. All right. And I think you explained in your statement that the borrowing didn't comply with the accredited franchise policy for Pi Phase. That's That, I take it, refers solely to borrowing more than the SVR. Yes, correct. OK. Can I just correct one thing I think I heard you say? Because while we're here, I wouldn't want to... Uh, there still is security for a going concern. You can see that on the, the second page of that... Uh, there, at the bottom of the second page. Because I, I thought you said, it, I, I might have misheard you, but I thought you implied that it might have been unsecured. There's still a fixed and floating charge of the language at that time. Uh, first mortgage, there's appropriate guarantee from directors and franchise ease and other tangible security as may be necessary. So uh, I, it's, it's not a, I, thought, I wouldn't want you to, I wouldn't want the commission to assume it's a completely unsecured loan once that, 
that that tricks and still secured there is some security there yes it, it's secured it's secured against the businesses <coughs> so that is you've got a fixed and floating charge over the property if there's been a purchase of property for the purposes of the business you'll have a mortgage over that property you'll also take a guarantee from the directors yes it's not your point is this is not unsecured borrowing thank you yes i understand and and so then in practical terms how if we come to this case study In relation to the borrower, Marjo, mm -hmm. would there have been any difference in approach that you would you would expect in relation to assessment if this was done under the accredited franchise policy rather than under the general business lending policy? Well, they'd have to comply with the franchising policy that we we just went over. Well, we in relation to, oh, the interest cover and things like it's that. SVR, it's a higher interest cover. Yes, so that, that, that would apply. All right. Can we, can we bring up Exhibit 30? So this is the franchise system profile for the pie face franchise as at July 2011. Yes, that's correct. And as we understand it, this wasn't updated and, well, it, this was the policy that the profile that would have been in place as at the time that Marjo made its borrowing. Yes. In, all right. And then if we go to page dot zero three three three. So this sets out some benchmark trading results for franchisees in the Pie Face franchise system. At July 11, yes. 2000, yes. Is there, when you say that, is there some update that you've seen to those figures that would have applied as that? No, there's not. Okay. And if a borrower came and wanted to borrow only up to the relevant sector value ratio to buy a pie face franchise. Would these franchise trading results and projections be something that would be relevant to assessing the borrowing? Yes. And how would they be relevant? Well, they're, they're the guide for, as we've called here, low average and, and high benchmarks, and that's determined more by the, the sales at the top, and, and they'd be the, the benchmarks you'd be, be looking for from, from the business. Gives the, the banker a guide. All right. And can we put that then on... Well, oh, actually, I'm sorry, just before we move off that, can we go to page dot zero three four six? So this is the recommendation that was made by the New South Wales Franchise and Development Manager and appears to then be accepted and approved. And you can see that if you turn ultimately over to page dot zero three four eight. Oh, I'm sorry, it gets yes, dot zero three four. Yes, it does. I think we should just check one thing, which is you see that recommendation in the box is a 60% SVR. Agreed. And for existing stores, it's a 1.75 multiplier applied to EBITDA capped at 60%. Yes. The, and I just want to clarify, as I understand it, that is what is accepted and approved. Is that right? Or no, as, as you can see in the, on three, 0348, or we can see, I think it's um, it changes. redacted here. It changes to a lower, Ratio. All right, to 50% SBR and 1.75 times EBITDA capped at 
Is that right? Yeah, yes. I'm oh, sorry, are you concerned that this is... No, no. I just have it redacted on mine. But oh, that's no, good. but it's... Well, the version we have doesn't seem to have been... OK, that's OK. Sorry, that's why that, 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 that was a concern. No, I appreciate the no. worry. I get lots of blue highlighting. It concerns me too, Mr Welsh, I can assure you. Um, it's much more concerning... I'm just getting when, used to it, though. Yes, it's much more concerning when just black pages pop up on the screen. Um, that's because I'm fearful of somebody else. Uh, now... <laughs> <laughs> Understand. <laughs> So I want to just make sure I've understood the detail of this then, which is that if, if Marjo had come along and said, we want, to, we want to buy this existing Pyface franchise to go under this accredited, approved and accredited policy, mm -hmm. they could have borrowed up to 50% of the purchase price, is that right? That is, is the purchase price taken to be equivalent to the turnkey value of the business? Y yes. And, but a further limit would be that they could only borrow 1.75 times the EBITDA for the established business? Yes. And that would additionally be capped at 50% of the purchase price of the business. For the existing stores, yes. And that reflects, I take it, the level of risk that Westpac would be comfortable with in relation to a pie Pace franchise under this policy. Yes. And the relevant parts of the policy, as you point out, are it's, it's lending against cash flow, but it still requires security over yes. the entirety of the business. Mm -hmm. And it also requires, as you pointed out, guarantees to be given by the directors of the business. Yes. And presumably then, assuming that these sorts of franchises are being bought by an individual or a couple or a small group that are looking to run a small business, the giving of the guarantee will, by the directors, will effectively then mean it's being secured by their personal assets. It could, yes. And in giving a guarantee, would it also be necessary for a mortgage to be obtained from the director to secure the guarantee? Um, not necessarily if they complied with this, this policy. See. But in any event, no, that's right, I, I withdraw that. So that would be one potential yep. difference, which yep. is they don't need to have a mortgage to secure the guarantee, but they'd still have to give the guarantee. An unsupported guarantee. guarantee. But they'd still have to give the guarantee. That's the normal practice, yes. yes. And this is really a, a risk balancing exercise mm -hmm. for Westpac it gathers a lot of financial data, it makes an assessment as to what level of risk it's willing to tolerate up to that particular amount of security. Yes. And is an advantage of having this sort of accredited franchise or policy that it, it makes for some ready rules to be able to facilitate lending to what are going to be small businesses? Yes, it does. Does Westpac see it as something that is favourable or facilitative to having lending to small businesses? Uh, yes, it does. Right. And are there advantages to Westpac in having these types of accredited franchisors? I think it's a, it's a risk-based uh, approach and it gives the guidance uh, to to our banker and and also gives guidance to the market of, of what we might be looking to do and it, and as you were talking about before it, it shows some on one of those pages there it shows the results and projections it also shows uh, the the franchising setup costs so it gives a number of what you'd expect with the the cost would be for a low average and, and high as well so it, it, it helps with a risk-based decision. It's a risk-based management approach. 
And one of the things I wonder about then is, is it is an advantage of this that a potential small business owner might come to the franchisor and the franchisor would in turn direct that potential small business owner and therefore potential borrower to Westpac for their loan to buy the business? Yes, there is an advantage to a franchisor of having uh, accredited banks because then the banks will typically understand what they're doing and what their strategy is and and will, it will help in a risk-based decision. But also for Westpac, there's an advantage, isn't it? Doesn't It sets up some potential of referrals coming from the franchise or to the bank? It, uh, not, not necessarily, that's, but they will, they will publish and, and say that Westpac is accredited or Bank X is accredited. So they will, they, they, will, they will use that, yes. They will use that information to share it with potential franchisees. Do you know whether Pieface was accredited with any other bank? No, I don't. Okay. That, you, did you listen to Ms. Messiah's evidence yesterday? I listened to the majority, but not all of it. A few dropped out a little bit. All right. Did you? She gave some evidence, which was that when she'd spoken to the franchisor, the franchisor had suggested to her that it would be necessary for her to move all of her borrowings over to Westpac. Did you hear that? I evidence? did hear that. And do you have a view about? perhaps break it down first is that would that have been correct no other than, i suppose i should qualify other than that if for example it was necessary that there be security over her house and there was already a first mortgage over her house then with another institution then it may have been an issue for westpac if it was only the second mortgagee i assume but other, other than perhaps some issue around that, it's not a requirement. No, there's no, no requirement. And does it surprise you then that the franchisor would be saying something like that to the franchisee? Or potential franchisee? Potent yes, it does surprise me. Perhaps one possibility here is there's just some misunderstanding of what it is that the franchisor was saying to the franchisee. You just can't comment on that. Hard to speculate. <laughs> Very hard. I wasn't there. And then can we, can we go back to the page dot 0334? Mm -hmm. Sorry, dot 0333. Now just leave that there for a moment and we'll come to it shortly. Uh, you, you know that Ms. Messiah applied for and well, applied for finance and was ultimately granted finance? The, to, the company. Yes, yes, the company, Marjo. Yes, Marjo did, yes. And before we come to the detail of that, is that something that you reviewed or you've reviewed the documents for to form a view about whether or not the loan should have been made? Yes, I have. And have you formed a view about whether the loan should have been made? Yes. And what is your view, Mr Welsh? The loan should have been made. Should have been made? Yes. Okay. And do you want to just explain to us, you're aware obviously of the FOS decision, FOS determination? Yes, I am aware of that. And I take it from what you say, then you disagree with the FOS determination? Uh, I disagree with the way the, the FOS made the determination, but I do agree that we are bound by the FOS determination and, and we uh, have, have met that determination. But I disagree in, with, in two main ways with the FOS determination. Of course. And so to be fair to you, of course, Westpac has complied with the FOS determination. It was binding on Westpac? It is. We are bound by them, yes. And you've yes. complied with it? Yes. And all you're raising here then to assist the Commissioner are the, the two ways in which you disagree with the reasoning of FOS? That is correct. And do you want to, perhaps if we take them one at a time, do you want to explain the first way in which you disagree 
with their yes. reasoning? So, um, Commissioner, in uh, assessing uh, the serviceability, one of the normal practices is to provide what we call a buffer on the interest rate. So that's a, a higher level of, of uh, interest rate for the serviceability. The implication of that is it makes uh, it takes it through the cycle. It makes it uh, obviously uh, a little bit um, more conservative in our approach. Uh, Foz's determination was that they used a 50%, another 50% on top of the interest rate, and I think that is, uh, my personal view is that is very high. They used a 3% buffer for a business loan. Yeah, so your, the buffer that had been used by Westpac was 1.5%? Uh, Westpac's policy is to, uh, is to either take the, the higher off, the actual interest rate, or a, at that point in time, what we call the BSR, which was the um, 6.5. So it was the higher off. Right. So the more conservative approach. But I, I thought when you were saying they took a 50%, it was 50% higher, that was because the buffer that was used by FOS was 3%, and the buffer that had been used by Westpac was 1.5%. Uh, sorry, let me... Clarify, uh, FOS used a 3% uh, buffer yes. above the loan. Yes. Yes. And, and you said 50% oh. higher, or did you mean 50% higher than the interest rate? Sorry, muddling numbers here. Uh, for clarity, it is, let's, let's call it 6%. They added another 3%. Yes. So my 50% of my statement was... Three on six. <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I understand. And your point is the buffer that you would have added or that you'd have considered appropriate would be what's one and a half percent on top. Well, but, uh, I think the rate was five point something at the time and we took the higher of 6.5. Right. You know, Three percent buffer, in our view, would would prohibit a lot of business lending. All right. And that is, and that is a... Well, that, that would be very concerning for me. All right. And... Are you able to explain to the Commissioner two things? The first is when Westpac goes about figuring out what buffer should it allow, what's the process that it goes through to figure that out? There must be some judgment involved in that. I don't know the technicalities of it. Apologies, it's not my area of expertise. There's some smart mathematicians that, that work that out. All right. And when FOS went about coming up with its 3%, could you understand what the rationale was for picking 3%? No. Okay. And so the judgment that you're making is to say, in your experience as a banker, to start using a, a buffer which equates to 50% of the interest rate is likely to have a significantly detrimental effect on the ability of the bank to lend to small businesses. Uh, that's one argument. Yes. There's also another. And what's the other argument? The, the, the other argument is small businesses are, uh, when they're gearing up, uh, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty challenging environment for businesses out there. And if if they're, they're gearing up and the banks banks are adding another three percent on their ability to to back themselves and get a loan, that would that would mean a lot of businesses would struggle to get finance at, at that 50% buffer mark. So I think it would, would limit a, a lot of the businesses in that growth phase. And was there another, have you covered the two areas? No. There's a we, second area that you want to... There's wanted, more. So, there's <laughs> more. So, could you perhaps then tell the Commissioner what's the second way in which you disagree with the FOS determination? Um, it, it was to do with the... Um, the amortisation. So, Commissioner, typically the, the approach is you obviously have to have interest and the amortisation over the term of the loan. Um, FOS deemed that it was appropriate to amortise a uh, overdraft, and we describe an overdraft as a come-and-go working capital facility. So, in a normal operating business through a normal cycle, that should go up when when that needs to, and then be paid down as the funds come in and out. So when you're looking at the establishment of a business, you, you want to make sure the overdraft is intended to be come and go. So that was the first part of it. The second part of it is FOS uh, also determined that the banker undertaking, and, and effectively it was a, a guarantee for the, for the rent, 
they amortise that. Our approach is to take the the fee for uh, the the fee for the six month fee as the as the charge there, not amortise a uh, a contingent liability. So they were they were the two fundamental views that that we took. And what I'd like to do now is Can I just understand what her, what time horizon is relevant to those inquiries. Uh, you, you are saying, uh, look, we've got to uh, cope with the fact that interest rates may move. Mm. We've got to uh, look at questions of, should I take account of amortising yep. the overdraft to zero? Yep. Uh, what's the relevant time horizon Thank you. Uh, that should be in mind, in your view, when well, you're making these assessments? Well, in my view, I don't think you should be amortising the overdraft or the, the guarantee, the contingent liability. So there is no time horizon. I don't, don't think you should. So that's that one. Um, the, the time horizon for looking at your BSR, as we call it, but the, that, that is a rate that we will assess. You know, the facts are that I, I don't think interest rates have gone above that rate over the period. We're in a low growth, low interest rate environment, and um, to sort of so the, the 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 it hasn't moved. You would want to move it as the as the market moved and 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 look at it dynamically. Yet it's not something you're moving all the time, particularly in this low growth interest rate environment. Yes. More questions you had about that, no. Commissioner? Thank you. Mr Welsh, what I'd like to do now is, you might keep that and mm -hmm. document on the screen and move it to one side, and I'd like to have a look at the credit assessment memo for mm -hmm. this particular application. Can we bring up what is tab 38 to Mr Welsh's statement? It's wbc.404.001.1016. And if we go to page dot one zero one eight. This is the dynamic deal build request form output. Yes. We've looked at one of these already. I want to go first to page dot one zero two three. And can we blow up the section called transaction risk? And you see, it's explained, the transaction risk is medium. I should probably ask you to begin with, are there different grades of transaction risk that would be used for these types of deals? There's different grades, yes. And what does medium indicate? From memory, 100% LVR was at the medium. Okay. Yes. And it explains the transaction makes sense to the bank. The facilities requested will be fully secured by residential properties. LBB recommend, I'm sorry, what's LBB? Is that local business banker? Yes, it is. Local business banker recommending to take out fixed and floating charge over the business as we are relying on business income when serviceability was calculated. Mm -hmm. And then the transaction makes sense to the customer. This will be an opportunity for them to manage and own their business with a possibility of acquiring more pie-faced business in the future. Yes. And in that sense, is it fair to say, one of the things that you would probably point to looking through this is there is a, there's a consideration not just of something that's in the interests of the bank, but also of understanding what the desires and goals are of this small business or these small business people. That is correct. And then if we go over to page.1024, and blow up the section serviceability slash end clearance <coughs> risk, 
So this explains that the local business banker calculated two serviceability scenarios mm -hmm. and it's based on profit and loss provided, but it explains, please note that there is no current financial available, business is only eight months old. And can I ask what, from your review and looking at the documents, what's your view as to the appropriateness of making a loan in circumstances where the business has been going for eight months, but apparently there's no current financial available? Uh, what is my, can just the question? What is your view as to the appropriateness or the significance of that in making the loan? I think it's a factual statement. So if, the, the, if that uh, was, that's factual statement, so you have to rely on that if it had only been going for eight months. As, as, was, as we uh, will uncover further, that was not correct. The business had been uh, running for a six-month period and then another nine-month period, and there's further dialogue in the file on that. Um, setting, though, aside the, the detail of that, I just want to just take the hypothetical of it, which mm. is the business is only been going for eight months. There's no current financial available. Is that something that is significant or insignificant in the context of making the lending decision? I think it's an important part of making a lending decision if you've only got eight months financials and, and you've got them. You well, want to review them and be very clear on them. And then if we go to page 1026. And you see at the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. There's something which is, or well, it's under a section called sector policies. Yes. And does this, it says that the sector policy is franchise. Mm -hmm. Does that connect to that, back to the franchise data that we're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen for PyFace, or is that something different? Uh, my, my assumption is it does connect. Okay, and we see that it said sales as per projected cash flow, $525,000, which is below benchmark. Yes. And then gross profit, I'm not sure why that's redacted. It's not subject to a non-publication direction, but it's the gross profit is 63%. Yes. And it's noted there that that's 1% more than benchmark. If we can just pull that down again so that we actually see the benchmark. Mm -hmm. So the, the benchmark at the low, mid, average and high scenarios is 62%. Mm -hmm. So this is just pointing out it seems to be 1% higher than that benchmark. Yes. And then at the bottom of the page, average weekly sales of $10,750, it says which reflects to the above, but not within the benchmark. And we can see over on the left-hand side, looking at the detailed financial information that Westpac had available about PyFace franchises, mm -hmm. that the low, the low average weekly sales is $13,000, and the average is $17,000, and the high is $21,000. Is that something that, so that, difference then between the average weekly sales being shown and what Westpac knew or had available to it from its benchmarking. Is that something that you would expect to have been of concern? Uh, it should be noted, and it was. And I just want to chase that through. How far does that go, though, from your perspective? If you're being a responsible banker, what are you supposed to do with that information? Well, the, what, the, what the banker did note here was that not within the benchmark. However, as mentioned before, this is due to the store being a small store, and all figures reflect on each factor. So, that's, so they, they were recognising in the submission that this was a kiosk-type store, and um, I've read that somewhere else. Apologies, I can't recall where. So it was... a. And I'm not sure why, but you know, I think the deal has slightly changed a little bit. It was at the smaller end of their source because it was kiosk. 
And we just turn over the page to 1027. This might be the part you're referring to at the top of the page. Well, thank you. This is a small store in the shopping centre. Kindly note that the store is a kiosk style store. Mm -hmm. Not were there many, although having said that, were there many pie faces that weren't kiosk style stores? I'm not going to be able to help you there, sorry. <laughs> I take it you never had a kit at pie face, <laughs> Mr Welsh. <laughs> Turns out not enough people did. Um, so the, what I want to just understand though is when you look at this transaction assessment, the way that it's put is that the assessment is lower than sector policy benchmark for pie face and then it said well that's explained by the fact that the key, that the store is a kiosk style store and it said our customer is purchasing the pie face however this will be fully secured by their residential homes and does that suggest that the comfort for the bank in this is that the residential homes are available as security and so that makes the bank more relaxed about the fact that the performance is not in line with the franchise benchmarks? Uh, I'd, I'd use slightly different words, but what it would signal to the, to the banker is you, you start to look for other mitigations. So well, I, my read of what the banker was saying here, the other mitigations is that uh, you have other incomes and other security. So you've moved away from just looking at this transaction and you look at the broader what's involved in the transaction. And, and that's quite a normal part. You expect risks come up and then the, you expect the banker to mitigate them and look more broadly around what the, what the mitigants might be. Right. And I take it apart from the the things that were concluded by FOS, looking back through these documents, th there's nothing in it from your perspective that suggests that there was something inappropriate on the part of the banker in accepting the information that was provided and the way that information was assessed and then ultimately in the making of the loan? Broadly, I'm, I'm happy with it. There's a few things that... I've read that I'm not that I would have liked to have seen more information. There's a few gaps there that that I would have liked to have have seen filled and and a bit more explanation around. Yeah. And and you can see that later in the file where there's a bit of a to and froing from the credit on the credit officer on a number of options and questions coming back. So there was obviously lots of discussions going on as the deal got built up and bits of information was flowing around. But there were there was, there's still a few gaps there though. Right. And. We can go to these documents if you wish. I assume you've looked at them or they've been provided to you. You know that Westpac hadn't conducted a review of the Pie Face franchise system in 2012. Had not, sorry? Had not conducted a review in 2012. Correct. And in 2013, I'm assuming you've seen there's some internal notes or emails where it's noted that no review had been done in the preceding year. Yes. And at that time, Westpac decided that it was it would suspend the accreditation of PIFACE? That it's correct. And in suspending the accreditation of PIFACE in 2013, Westpac was concerned about two aspects, I think. One was the risk of any of lending it had made to Pieface, the the franchisor, is that right? Or is it only concerned about the second aspect, which is that there's it's whether it should lend to additional franchisees having regard to its concerns about pie face? Yeah, there, were, there were two bits. There was l the lending, any lending to the franchise or that yes. was parked and kept separately. Then it was uh, the, typically when you are looking at a portfolio like this, you're looking at future, future, whether you're going to be accrediting future franchisees. So we, at that point, we determined to um, remove the accreditation. And the concern is, as to the second part, 
that having regards to your concerns about the system at that time, that it's no longer, it's no longer net safe, I think might be a, one way of putting it, to be lending in accordance with the policy to franchisees. Well, the, the, the specifics on this one was that they had a tax liability and tax liabilities are a signal that, that all might not be going as well and they'd had a number of calls on some guarantees and, and that's when you're getting those, there's, 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 it's, it's a trigger that something up and we made the call until we could remediate that position or got more comfortable with it that we wouldn't allow any further uh, lending to franchisees under the sector policy. And I think perhaps just to, so that we can nail this down to a time period, can we bring up WBC.404.014.0582? Give me a hint on the tab. Yeah. Oh, that's not in your <laughs> oh, <okay>. folder. <laughs> Don't know that number. And I think this is the, this might have been one of the types of documents you're referring to. You've had a look at these chain of emails before you've given evidence, I assume? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. And so what happens is that the, if we take the, we don't necessarily need to do the earliest email in time, but if we take the email at the bottom of the page on the 26th of July 2013, it said franchisor has gone e I'll just go down to it so I can... Oh, yes, sorry. Thanks. Franchisor has gone E35 due to tax arrangements. Franchisor facilities are fully cash secured. What does E35 mean? Uh, E35 is a risk grade that we use for our watch list clients. And it's then explained that while there may be reasons around this, I consider the situation completely unacceptable for a franchise intangible lend. Yes. And then the response is, I agree, there are enough warning signs here which effectively mean we have little choice but to remove accreditation. Yes. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 3.23, emails between Skewens, Jackie and others, 26 July 13, WBC 404-014-0582. And then if we go to dot triple zero three. I'm sorry, WBC.416.004.0003. So this is another chain of emails, but I just want to deal with the email on the 30th of July, which is at the top of the page, which is the next day. And you'll see again that what this is confirming is that it would be prudent at this point to suspend PyFace accreditation until a review is completed to the satisfaction of credit policy. It sets out various warning signs, including by this stage, franchisee legal action, and then says, if we as a bank are not prepared to lend to the franchisor, it does not seem wise to lend to the franchisees on an intangible security basis. And that reflects the decision that was made and I think recorded in your, or you explained in your statement by Westpac to suspend the accreditation. That's correct. And the point of this is, at this point in time, by suspending the accreditation, what's happening is that the bank is no longer lending on what's described here as the intangible security basis. It's no longer just sticking to that sector value ratio approach. The, a banker is no longer to utilise that policy for new business. But that policy in any event was not used for the loan to Marjo. That is correct. Right. And <coughs> is that email chain going in? Oh yes, I tend to that condition. Exhibit 3.24, email Jackie A. Watt and others, 30 July 13, WBC 416004003. Commissioner, is that a convenient time? I won't be that much longer but with Mr Welsh, but perhaps if we just bring him back at... 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Welsh, I just wanted to go back to something you were explaining before the break or before lunch about that annual versus three yearly review. Can we bring up tab four to your statement, which is WBC.409.004.0206? This is the Franchise System Accreditation Standards? Yes. And you explain in paragraph 53 of your statement that reviews were governed by this standard? Yes. And I thought before the break you were referring to short-term versus, lo sorry, short-form versus long-form reviews? Yes. And under the franchise system profile at the bottom of the page, you see there's a reference to annual reviews long form and then a further reference to franchise system annual review and it explains that there's you to do an annual review if it doesn't meet the requirements mm -hmm. for a short form annual mm -hmm. review. Mm -hmm. and, and is that is that the point that you were making before lunch or were you suggesting something slightly different as to your understanding of how the oh, that, that's is. the point i was making yes that it if you satisfy the criteria if a franchise or satisfy the criteria then just be a short form review done annually yes. is that right yes so there'd always be a review but it would be either short form or long form um no that's if you go perhaps to page zero two zero nine <coughs> You'll see there's the two types, short form annual review and long form mm -hmm. annual mm -hmm. review. Mm -hmm. Is that, that's slightly different from your understanding, I take it. It is. You had thought it was only necessary to do, at the time, that is back in 2011, 2013, you only needed to do a review every three years. Um, uh, 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 under the short, Franchise system can only qualify for short time reviews two years and six, every three years each system must be reviewed in the long form. Yes. Yeah, that's the... So, so each year there's to be either a short form annual review or a long form annual review. Um, let me just, sorry, can you just give me a moment to cl clarify that? So my, my understanding of, of this is you can see on the, the page you drew, drew me to 0209 and you see that on the um, last stop point in that first box, every three years is the long form review. That's where I was from there. So am I following you correctly? So I'm not, I'm, I think we're in disagreement. What that box okay. says is franchise systems can only qualify for short form reviews two years in succession. Yes. Every third year, each system must be reviewed in long form. Yes, yes, in the long form. So there must be a long form every three years. Yes. And each year, there's to be an annual review. Do you agree with that? I, the, the practice that we adopted, if there was a material change, you know, if there was a change, that's what, that's what I thought occurred there. I might have... And. Again, just to clarify, the short form annual review, when you look at the requirements of it, it's pretty limited. It would yes. only require updating the franchise system profile document with current yep. details provided by the system, yep. if provided necessary. Yep. And within the general sec comments section of yes. this document, the FDM is to provide an undertaking and confirm that no adverse features are known. Yes. And that did not occur. That didn't occur. Yes. and. And so let's just break that down. The first thing is there was no 
undertaking given by the FDM, who is the franchise, is it franchise or development manager? Franchise development manager. Franchise development manager. The franchise development manager didn't give an undertaking in 2012 that no adverse features were known? That's correct. In, oh no, I, I haven't in respect, seen... Uh, uh, in respect sorry. of pie face. Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen one, so I, I don't know whether they did or they didn't, but I, we weren't able to, to find one that I've, I wasn't able to cite one. And under this policy, in the absence of that undertaking, a long-form annual review was to occur? <coughs> yes. And the long-form annual review should have occurred for Pie Face in 2012, but it didn't? I'm getting a little confused, please. Yes. Let me break it down. Phrase I think I'm using <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, the not just with you. The franchise develop franchise development manager had to provide an undertaking that no adverse features were known. That's one of the requirements. Yes, correct. And if you look up the page under qualifications for short form annual review, one of the qualifications was the provision of that undertaking. Yes. If you didn't qualify, if a franchise system didn't qualify for short form annual review, then the franchise had to be reviewed under the long form annual review? If it didn't qualify, meet those hurdles. Yes. yes. Pie Face in 2012 didn't qualify under the qualifications for short form annual review? I don't know. Well, it could only qualify if there was an undertaking that had been given. But well, I haven't seen an undertaking. And I, no I one could find an undertaking. Correct. And therefore, it would appear as if what was necessary was a long form annual review? If a short form wasn't done, but 2012, we weren't able to find one. And had a long form annual review been done, then it would have been necessary, it would have been required that necessary documents and financial information be obtained from the franchise system? A long one, yes. Under the long form? That's yes. Right. All right. And then can we bring up WBC.409.003.0240? So this is the deal header in respect of Pie Face. That's the franchise or is that right? Or yes. the franchise system. Yes, it is. And if we go over to page dot zero two four one And type's quite small. If we just... If you could use that blow-up technique, that would yes. be useful. If we blow up the section under the... In the first box dated the 9th of February 2012, if we blow up the paragraph at the end of that box beginning, CRAA indicates... So, who's the CRAA? Don't know. Sorry. Okay. What's the, what does it stand for? Or you're not sure? Not sure. Credit, Credit risk is... assessment something? Might be. <laughs> and not so good on 2011 acronyms. And it explains there's been a default that's been loaded in respect of pie face and then concludes by saying we will also require financial statements to ascertain trading position and reassess CRG. Yes, that's correct. And then if we yes. take that down and blow up under the section 28 February 2012. Mm -hmm. And blow up the section under housekeeping issues. in the middle of the page. 
where it, so this is as at February 2012, upon receipt of latest financials deal to be submitted and background slash business risk section in sponsor memo updated with relevant information to fully understand how the business operates, including details, locations of retail stores, directors, shareholdings, details. And remind me of that date, please. That's the 28th of February 2012. Thank you. And then if we come down to the 27th of March 2012, And then we blow up the section. If we just note there's a phrase which is default against pie face was dealt with via TLW deal number 101355049. Do you know what that means? Yes, I do. And what does that mean? Um, that's reference to another credit memo like this. So this is, this is the uh, banker's credit memo, the banker of the... Pie Face franchise or right. So this is the the banker's notes. This is the banker's TLA record of that, which is the lending origination system, the lending system. And it means what had been a default against Pie Face had been dealt with by a TLW deal. What does TLW deal mean? That's a previous one of them. So what what we're working through here is the previous background of the decisions. Mm -hmm. So there'll be another submission like this that will have the, where they would have worked that through. So if you track down that deal number, um, that would be there'd be another submission that would cover that. But that that deal number is the very first one on the 9th of February 2012. Uh, it's hard to follow, but that's right. Um, and then, as at the 18th of October 2012, if we blow up the last four lines at the bottom of the page. You'll see it said pending current financials being reviewed. Mm -hmm. So as at, it appears, as at the 18th of October 2012, the financials hadn't yet been the review of them hadn't been completed? For this submission, for at that time? Yes. Yes. And have you seen any record of the receipt of all of PyFace's financial statements in 2000, or financial statements from PyFace in 2012 by Westpac to ascertain, effectively to carry out an annual review during that year? No, I haven't looked into the franchise or records. Okay. Apologies. I. I didn't think that was part of... No, that's all right. Part. And then by the beginning of 2013, if we go over the page to dot zero two four two, and by the 27th of February 2013, if we pop out the first line underneath that beginning deal declined... The deal declined by DE. What's DE stand for? Do you know? Don't know. Deal declined by DE due to connection, and the connection is pie face. Is that right? Correct. Pie face not being in good standing, one default and two judgments listed against the company yep. in CRAA. Yep. And then. The view may be that that's Credit Reference Agency Australia. Thank you, Commissioner. You agree? You think that's what it means? I think so, but I don't, I don't know. He's much better than I. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, Real good I am, but I'm being a little more I mean, careful I say on, that, <laughs> on what I call on this now. I guess you know where. <laughs> that's not been my experience, Commissioner. Uh, <laughs> the, and then subsequently, as we know, we come then four months later to when the suspension yep. occurs yep. from Pi Face. Yep. Now, what I'm interested in is, from the bank's perspective, does it, is its reflection that not having conducted an annual review in 2012 was a failure on its part, something it ought to have done? Um, no, no, I don't, I don't think 
uh, sorry, an annual review of a yeah. short form review of the financials. Well, I think well, a for, short form review of the franchising operating system. Are you asking about? I know. Um, at the moment, I'm asking about a long form. I think I should be more specific. Okay. Is it a? Does the bank regard it as a failure or oversight not to have conducted a long form annual I, review? I think we're muddling a few things here. Maybe if I can just clarify something of my understanding on this. This this here is the record of lending to the franchise system. So this is our banker writing their normal deal. And so those references there for overdue account, accounts are quite normal as you're getting their accounts to make an assessment of the, the guarantees and the facilities that we find. So that's an independent assessment of the, the uh, franchisor, as it, as it just so happens that we are the, we were the banker to them. So that, that's at one end and, and needs to be split quite differently from what the franchise development manager would do. What the franchise development manager should do is do a short form uh, report and I was not able to find that short form report. So I don't know whether one was done or not done. I understand what you, and let me put it back to you and to see if <laughs> I've correctly understood it. You're saying you have to draw a distinction between on the one hand, the lending by the bank to the yes. franchisor, yep. And on the other hand, the lending by the bank to its to the franchisees of the franchisor. That's yes, the first part. And the second part is this document that we're looking at, which is identifying problems and problems dating back mm. to the beginning of 2012. Mm. That's problems in relation to lending to the franchisor. Yes. And there's a separate process or a separate person who ought to be responsible for managing the franchise system and lending to the franchisees. Yes. And under the policy, that, that person doesn't appear to have given the necessary undertaking so that only a short form annual review is required? I you haven't been able to find it. I haven't been able to find it. But in any event, Since. it's not evident that any long form annual review was carried out in 2012. Correct. And the fact that no long form annual review was carried out in 2012, to return to my question from a few minutes ago, is that something that Westpac regards as a failure on its part? Well, if the short form review didn't occur, it would be yes. Right. And beyond that, is it fair to say what the consequence of that might or might not have been for any franchisees that Westpac was prepared to lend money to in 2012 and the first half of 2013 is from Westpac's perspective just a matter of pure speculation. So can you read? Re Let me I'm put it another way. I'm, I'm, we, have, okay. we have no idea what it is that would have happened if Westpac had performed a long form annual review of the Pie Face franchise in 2012? Correct. We just don't know. You don't know. And whether it would have resulted in the action from mid-2013 being brought forward a year earlier and suspending accreditation, we just don't know. That's correct. And if Marjo had come in August of 2013, to Westpac rather than in 2012 and sought money to buy an existing Pie Face franchise. So take that as the hypothetical. Uh, mm -hmm. Having regard to the suspension of the franchise system, would there have been a different outcome as to whether the money was loaned out to Marjo? Uh, hypothetically, yes and if they were borrowing under the franchise policy. Well, of course, they weren't borrowing under the franchise policy. Yes. But when it came to the assessment of whether to make this loan or not, would it have made any difference at all? Well, I think the, the benchmarks still would have stayed. The, the, the benchmarks would have been relative. So it may have made a difference, but it's hard to speculate. Yes. It was the point that... When it came to the income, when you were dealing with it in 2012, you had the benchmarks, but they weren't being assessed under that 
franchise policy that required assessment with respect to the benchmarks? That's the first point? Well, we don't know that because we couldn't find the, the short form. No, no, I'm sorry, I've, I've confused things. In 2012, when Marjo yep. applied for money, it yep. wasn't assessed under the franchise policy. You got me back, yep. yep. And, and yes, there were benchmarks within the franchise policy that it's obvious that credit people within Westpac took into account in looking at Marjo's facility, but they weren't determinative in deciding whether to make the loan to Marjo. I think the, 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 bench, the benchmarks would have been looked at and one of the things that was, was factored in, you'd use a number of different things to pull information, historical accounts, forecasts, the benchmarks. So you're trying to put together the puzzle. All right. And well, the way in which ultimately the cash flow was tested was by evaluating cash flow and serviceability in two different ways for Marjo? Yes. And... Are you able to, I can take you to the FOS determination if that would help, maybe just mm -hmm. as a reference point. If we go to WBC.404.012.0, <laughs> which should be tab 58 of your document. And we go to page dot zero five one eight and blow up the part at the bottom of the page which is cash flow projections relied upon by the FSP showed there was net cash available for debt servicing. So you're just gonna oh, there we go, thank you. So there's this reference to the two different cash flow projections. Yes, yes. Are you able to just explain to the commissioner what's what's the process that's involved here for coming up with these two cash flow projections by Westpac? Uh, so the, the these are the two cash flows that the uh, that the company provided through their accountant. So they're the in one of the previous tabs they're the 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 cash flow and that's the top line revenue of uh, 300,000 as, as a base case, and the second one, cash flow two, is the other alternative. They provided two cash flows through their accountant. And these were the two that were provided by the applicant to Westpac and then used by Westpac in order to decide whether or not to make the loan? Along with a number of other things, yes. Right. And yes. one of the things that Westpac did was to do a attempt to do some sort of stress test of these, I'm, not, I'm using the word stress test, I'm not sure that's Westpac's word, but is it, that's what was a, a, a number of different scenarios. They looked at a number of different scenarios and, and tested those assumptions and the credit, you see that, that these were the two that the, the banker did and the credit officer did a, a, a number two, a number of them. Yes, if we go to page, oh, I'm sorry, to tab 38, which is WBC.404.001.1018, and go to page 1024. Mm -hmm. This is something we looked at before under the heading serviceability and clearance risk. Can we just blow that up? And this, as I understand it, are the scenarios done by the banker rather than by the credit officer, is that right? That's correct. All right. And the banker's second scenario seems to be that ICR, which is, is that interest cover ratio? Yes, it is. Interest cover ratio is below requirements loan requested will be fully secured by residential properties. And I think that might, I just want to be clear about this, that might be the bankers, the way in which the banker has framed it. But from Westpac's perspective, there are two different 
serviceability scenarios that have been done by the banker. That's yes. the first point. And the second point is there are other ways. This hasn't just been left by just automatically accepted by the credit officer. The credit officer has also looked at this as well. Correct. And the fact, therefore, that the effective level of the lending is effectively 125% of the purchase price of the business or something in that, or perhaps 110% of the purchase price of the business, because, oh, I'm sorry, $330,000 plus the, a further $32,500 for various things. Mm -hmm. That That's not lending that is simply derived from the fact that there is an asset. That's the first point. It's not from a residential asset. Um, so I don't understand the question. I'm sorry, I've put that very badly. When you read this note, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get you to confirm is perhaps what's obvious, but we ought to make clear. And that is, this isn't something where somebody is prepared to do this just because there are residential properties available as security. That is correct. There are a lot of other things that are taken into account in trying to assess the serviceability by Westpac. Yes. And it's certainly not the case that... Westpac was comfortable just lending money without being satisfied on various scenarios that it was possible to service this loan. Yes. And as it turned out, this loan failed, or well, the business failed and the loan couldn't have been repaid. Yes. But as we heard yesterday, there were many factors that went into the failure of that business. Yes. And that's certainly the view that Westpac takes, that it was prepared to back a business to lend money. And as it turns out, it's unfortunate that it failed. But as you said, you don't think that there was anything wrong with the way in which you went about doing it. That's correct. Now, the other thing that I want to ask you about then is the collections notices. Is this something you do accept Westpac got wrong? The collection, the sending of the collection notices? Yes, I do. All right. And if I can just summarise a few elements of this. Ms Messiah made a complaint to FOS and the consequence under the terms of reference is that the FSP, that's Westpac, ought to have stopped sending the collection notices? Yes. After the complaint had been made, Westpac's records are of 13 text messages being sent between the 17th of November 2016 and the 3rd of December 2016. Yes. And I'll just get up the document that you've exhibited. So I just want to ask you a couple of questions about this. It's tab 68. If we go to WBC.404.012.4242. So this is the, the internal record that Westpac has kept, is that right? This is one of the records. This, right. is, this is the one that tracks the texts. All right. And, and are you able to actually just explain to us what it means? What's the SMD ES2? And then once we get over the page, DST. Uh, no, I'm not able to explain the detail. Right. <laughs> Somebody's told you that it means that 17 text messages were sent. 13, uh, I think it was, wasn't it? Was uh, I'm sorry, 13 text messages over the course of... Uh, no, I, I, we did. Th this, is a, this isn't a, a great format of that, but yes, there, are, uh, there, are, there were 13. Sadly, there were 13 text messages that shouldn't have been sent. Yes. Yeah, and they shouldn't have been sent to, to Mr Messiah. And uh, there's two things I want to ask you about. Now, one is mm -hmm. this is obviously a breach of the terms of reference of FOS that Westpac has signed up for, and that's a problem? Yes, that's correct. Would it be a problem to send this many text messages to a customer trying to collect a debt if they hadn't made a complaint to FOS? Making a complaint to Foz isn't 
the determination for us that this shouldn't have happened. I see. So the, the problem is not simply the fact that it was a complaint while the FOS, it, sorry, it was sent while the FOS complaint was on foot. The complaint was also sending this many automated collection notices. Yes. All right. And do you know whether there's been investigation as to why it is that Westpac Systems did this? Uh, the, I don't know whether there was an investigation, but I, I asked that question and there was an explanation. And what was the explanation? The, the, the explanation was that we had been working uh, with uh, Marjo and the related parties and we tended to be focusing on the business. This was uh, Miss Messiah's own home loan and that was not connected to the business in error by us. So that's where we, we, we made an error by not having to manually load up the do not contact code for her, for, for her home loan. We had it on the business and those sorts of things, but not on her home loan. We made that error. Yes, I'm not sure that quite addresses the issue. So you're pointing out that she made a complaint to FOS and the complaint included her home loan and therefore the do not contact flag should have been put up with respect to the home loan, but it wasn't. Is that right? That is, yes. And the, the manual error is failing to load the do not contact flag in in light of the FOS complaint. Yes. But that means what otherwise happened was just the usual automated consequence that would happen without a FOS complaint. I don't. I didn't investigate that. Sorry, I didn't look at that. And so do you know, know whether anybody has investigated why it is that this would occur absent a FOS complaint? I, I wasn't an area I, I, I explored here. But certainly, from your perspective, that's unacceptable behaviour by Westpac to be sending debt collection text messages to a customer thirteen times in the space of seventeen days. Uh, it's not an area of my. Uh, expertise the collection side, but uh, but I, but but yes, th that seemed a lot to me. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Goldman. Two matters, please, Commissioner. First of all, Mr. Walsh, you were just asking questions a moment ago about the FOS determination mm -hmm. and uh, the reference in the FOS determination to two cash flows. Would you like me to bring that up again so that you can have a look at that? Yes, please. <laughs> oh, just one moment. in your folder, Mr. Which one? It's tab 58 in your 58, folder. 58, thank you. It's WBC 4040120507. And it's at page 0518. Thank you. It's reference here to two cash flows. I think you said they were cash flows provided by the Marjo accountant. Yes. And could you now go to the other folder, tab 34? This is document WBC 4040010302. Yes. Is it your understanding that if the operator could just sc scroll through that document and... Mr Walsh, you've seen this document before? Yes. Is it your understanding that this is the cash flow referred to in the FOS determination? Yes. And did you satisfy yourself from your review of the file that that was the cash flow projections provided by the Marjo accountant? Yes, I did. Secondly, um, you were asked some questions a short while ago about an annual review of the Pie Face franchise or in 2012. Yes. 
And whether or not there was a long form or short form review conducted? Yes. Uh, if the operator could please call up WBC 409-002-0418. You see that's a franchise system profile for Pyface in August 2012. Do you recall when the Marjo loan was applied for and granted? Around that period. Or, mm. or was it shortly before? Yes. And if the operator could go to the next page, please. And to the page after that, please. I don't mean to rush you through this, but perhaps just to assist with timing, I might just direct you to um, the next page, 0421. so that you get an idea of what's in this document. Uh, if, you could, if the operator could move to 0425. You see this, you were shown a similar, a, a document with a similar profile, but it was a different document. You yes. see this document um, also has the benchmark results in categories low, average and high. Yes. And you will see the reference to the last review and this review, and you note that the date for this review is the 30th of the 8th, 2012. Yes. And if we could go over to 0427. Mr. Well, she were able to say whether this is a short form or a long form review. There are further pages if you need to this look at This would be those. the long form one. Yes. So do you believe, based on this uh, document, that a long form review was conducted in August 2012? Yes. Nothing further, Commissioner. Thank you. Was this document in evidence, Ms. Ms. Oh, Kovshin, or not? Yes, please. I'll attend to that. Exhibit 3.25 will be franchise system profile uh, of what date, Ms. Ms. Colson? August 2012. August 2012, WBC 409 Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Could Mr. Welsh be stood down, Commissioner? Yes, thank you, Mr. Welsh. We will see you again, I think, later in the week, will we not? Yes.